Before we get into this week's show, we're expanding our podcast productions. So if you or someone you know needs some help supporting, launching or scaling a podcast, send a message to samantha at fabricacollective.com. Also, if you're enjoying the show, please subscribe, rate, recommend or review, depending on where you listen. And please check out our other podcast, The Raw Hospitality Show, with host Robert Marchetti. Now, on with this week's episode. I mean, it was an interesting process because it was a jumping off point for us from continually telling the addiction story. People gravitate towards that. People think they know everything about it. They, they love it in movies. You know, it's got this sort of romanticism or this swagger to it or whatever you want to call it. It's like the train spotting sort of thing or whatever or traffic. There's always that sort of thing about it that people want to read about. And I get that, you know, because it's compelling and it's heartbreaking and it's challenging and it just and it reveals the rawness of the human condition but the other side of that is that there's recovery and people do recover and even train spotting for me is a film about recovery at the end it's like choose life you know that's a recovery statement i know we're not happy mayhem and addiction then oh i'm in a 12-step meeting i'm all right and i get that that's not as compelling a story but i think it could be this week's guests are graham mackendo and susan stellan Graham, a photographer and associate professor at Parsons School of Design in New York City, has been in recovery from addiction since 2010. Graham and his wife Susan, a writer, researcher and adjunct professor at the New School in New York, have been open about Graham's past struggles with drugs. His 10-year journey to coming clean that began with nine months of incarceration because of a misdemeanor drug possession conviction. They've published and exhibited the self-portraits Graham took during his years of addiction written a dual memoir called Chancers and given many talks about the trajectory that upended Graham's highly successful photography career, isolated him from family and friends and eventually landed him in jail. I'll add links to the images that Graham took that appeared in The Guardian and The New York Mag, the book and all their talks in the show notes. Lately, they've shifted their focus to highlighting what it takes to recover from addiction, a process millions of Americans have been through but is far less discussed both in private and in public settings. They're part of a growing movement of people trying to reframe the narrative more towards solutions and opening a dialogue about ways to help more people succeed in recovery. If you know someone struggling with recovery or a family member trying to support a loved one, please share this important episode and some of the resources I'll put in the show notes. I hope you're inspired by the courage, clarity and candour of Graham McIndoe and Susan Stellan. Graham, Susan, welcome to the Impossible Network podcast. Thanks for having us, Mark. Good to be here. Great. Well, it's two years since we kicked off this podcast and I've been looking forward to interviewing you. And I should say to listeners that, Graham, you and I have known each other for uh, a long time, since the 80s, when we were runners uh, back in the day in Edinburgh, um, but now based both in New York. And Susan, I've got to know you over the last uh, few years as well, as my friendship with Graham has rekindled. The story that you've got to tell is one of huge transformation and is uplifting and certainly hopefully motivating to many people that will hear it. And I'm, from the work you're doing, the amazing work at the moment around recovery and your recovery project that we'll come and talk about, and certainly it's an important piece of work at a critical time, in certainly in this country and for other people around the world that are struggling with um, addiction and recovery. So perhaps you could just give a pop potted history um, in terms of where you came from, Graham, and how you ended up in a position of being an addict and then the transformational journey you've been on and the role that Susan played in that. Yeah, I mean, I've been in New York for 28 years, came here after graduating from art school in London, and everyone was fine for a while. You know, I was working, I was started working as a photographer my career was going well and I think like a lot of people you know I started using drugs casually because it was around me and it was hey why not you know I'd been drinking a bit you know so that's kind of how it started it wasn't something that I thought would entrap me in a, a decade plus a pain and anguish for myself, my family, for Susan, for other, my son, for people who knew me. I just thought I was going with the flow and it became more than a flow for me. It became a torrent of pain, really, to be honest. And I think that the trajectory is something that people kind of misunderstand because it starts with, uh, for a lot of people, we're just taking drugs and thinking, I mean, some people use them to escape the world or get high or get this or get that. But unless you're really careful, it can take you onto that. It becomes a habit and that habit becomes something really 
worse than that and then before you know it you're in full addiction and once you're in full addiction it's really hard to control because it really does control your life and that's where I found myself you know my life transformed my career well went out the window you know and my relationships with people transformed in a way that I would never have expected. And Susan, you played that pivotal part in Graham's, I suppose, physical and an emotional saviour, and particularly at a point in time when he was at risk of being deported as an immigrant. Well, yeah, we had been dating, um, and it became apparent that Graham was using drugs during that time. So our trajectory kind of in the early part of our relationship was kind of being together and then not together, and then um, him kind of trying to kick the habit. And, you know, even after we sort of more officially broke up, I had stayed kind of on the margins of his life um, because he was really starting to unravel in terms of just his ability to kind of navigate, particularly the criminal justice system. That was after he'd first gotten arrested for drug possession. There was a period of time where I was, you know, kind of trying to detach with love, they sometimes say, but, you know, be available. And that's when I found out several years later that he had actually spent the summer in Rikers Island. So because I knew that even a misdemeanor conviction could jeopardize his green card and his ability to stay in the U.S., I was trying to find out where he was and what happened to him. So at that point, he had just been taken into custody by ICE um, at the end of serving a sentence at and Rikers Island. For people Island. that don't know what ICE is? Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So oh, right, this yeah. was in the summer of 2010. So it wasn't really top of mind. You know, people weren't talking about deportation, you know, and I really had a lot of awareness of it. So that was kind of Graham had been moved first from New York City to New Jersey and then finally ended up in a county prison in Pennsylvania. And I was able to track him down and, you know, helped him get a lawyer. And that ended up being you know, almost five months that he spent in custody there and was very fortunate to win his case. Um, So he was released in January 2011 and ended up coming and moving in with me. So that was sort of the beginning of what I would say, you know, not necessarily the beginning of his recovery phase, but that period was very much not just recovering from addiction, but recovering from incarceration and specifically the deportation process. I don't think there'd be that many partners, girlfriends would go to the ends that you went to. And uh, the formidable challenge of taking on the immigration service must have been quite daunting. What gave you the confidence and the ability to do something that challenging? Yeah, I think that when you're personally exposed to the criminal justice system, even outside of ICE, I think the loss of freedom and when it affects someone you care about and you really viscerally experience what that means and, you know, are hearing from someone who's incarcerated and what that feels like to lose your liberty. I think more people than think that they would be motivated by that probably would be. And for me, it just was kind of seeing that injustice and And I've talked about it as sort of, it should be a fair fight, right? So, you know, we have established these immigration laws and rules, and they change over time, and there's kind of different awareness of what they mean and what the consequences was. But for me, it felt like, you know, Graham deserved to have a lawyer, and he deserved to make the case that he should be able to stay in the U.S. because the consequences for him if he had been deported were that he would be permanently barred from returning to the U.S. even as a visitor. And his son, who was in his late teens at the time, lived here and his whole, you know, career, photography career had happened in the U.S. and he just did not have the connections anymore that I think would have enabled him to kind of start over in the U.K. if he'd been deported. So for me, it was really go through the process and make a case to a judge and let a judge decide whether or not Graham deserved to be given a chance to stay here. Anyone that wants to learn more about the actual story, you documented it in a book in 2016 called Chancers, published by Random House. Random House yeah. And also, I'd certainly recommend watching the TEDx talk you did a couple of years ago that goes into more of the actual sort of transformation journey during that, so that those key years. And also, Graham, you've been documented widely in things like The Guardian and your images of your addiction are in the Scottish National Portrait Gallery and the New York Mag as well. So anyone that does want to go back and check out more, there's there's plenty there. But really, I think the interesting thing um, to focus on is the work you're doing now, which is documenting life beyond addiction, not yourself, but for others, and raising awareness of the, um, the challenges that that comes with. 
So perhaps you could talk about what motivated you to collectively, both of you, through images and words, take on this challenge and, and feel that you need to take a leadership position in it. So with the book, which was told from two points of view, you know, we have wrote different chapters alternating between, you know, what my experience was and what Graham's experience was. But I think because of that dual narrative in part and because of the time period when we wrote it, we actually didn't talk as much about the recovery phase. You know, the book kind of ends before the last 10 years, really, you know, of that process. So in some of the work that we first did, you know, and Graham can talk about, you know, publishing the self-portraits he took during his years of addiction, you know, we realized we had really been focusing on the addiction trajectory and Graham's criminal justice experience and my experience helping him with that, but hadn't really delved into the recovery period as much. So recently we've started kind of working on projects and exhibitions that, you know, not only tell that recovery story, but different aspects of people who help, you know, so whether it's harm reduction providers, treatment providers, recovery support services, curating an exhibition that first debuted in New York City and then now is in at City Art Space in Rochester, New York, that is a whole collection of projects. And the exhibition is called Beyond Addiction, Reframing Recovery. So it's really kind of trying to shift the focus beyond addiction and look at the things that can help people kind of put their lives back together. Yeah, I mean, just to backtrack a wee bit there on, and touch on something that you had mentioned earlier was the self-portraits and the published work, you know. A little bit like the immigration stuff, we did that at a time when not too many people were talking about the opioid crisis and it hadn't devastated middle America and sort of predominantly white communities opposed to the predominantly black communities in the past where drugs had become an affliction, you know. I'd taken these images during that time as my life was spiraling out of control being a sort of photographer I was wasn't working you know and I took it upon myself to sort of record what was going on around me I took photographs of many other people and I kind of used that as my excuse to take pictures I was documenting other people's lives and but in amongst all that I took pictures of myself and then as time went on I I stopped taking pictures of other people as much and started turning the camera on myself, my environment, and what was happening to me. And a lot of that sort of isolation that comes with addiction, you know, I found myself very isolated. I'd cut myself away from Susan, from my family, from friends, you know. Addiction's a very terribly shame-based thing, you know, and you feel like you're a disappointment to anyone and everyone. And it's really hard to just, as they say, man up and say, I have a problem, I need help. And people are ashamed to do that because they feel they'll be judged. But anyway, I had all these photographs that I'd taken over that period and then after detention, I found them, you know, because some of my stuff had ended up at Susan's, some ended up at different drug dealers' apartments, some ended up in storage, you know, and pulled it all together. And amongst all this stuff, I found these camera cards and I found burned CDs and stuff like that with all these images so I started to pull them all together and put them in one place and looking through them and it was kind of traumatic for me and for Susan. Uh, She'd seen some of them before because she knew I was documenting this and I think you know it's it's traumatic to see that addiction full frontal with someone actually doing it and uh, that you know and care about. So it was a tough thing just going through all those images and wondering, you know, what to do with them. But uh, I did eventually, after advice from some curators and writers and Susan and getting permission from my son and my family that I was going to go public with this and put them out there in The Guardian in New York Magazine and subsequently the National Portrait Gallery in Scotland. And it was daunting, but I still think it's the best thing that I've ever done, even though there is still ramifications for that because people can find me and judge me and see where I've been and what I've done. I felt like I opened doors and caused dialogue and conversations with people that I would never had that was before. Some of them friends of yours from Scotland, some of them friends I grew up with, some of them people that Susan's known that have come to me and opened up and said, wow, I saw your pictures, I saw what Susan interviewed you and in the magazine and this is what happened to me or this is what happened to my son, brother, cousin, aunt, uncle, dad. And it's just opened this whole world of people that where it's made me feel like I, wo- I felt alone, it only affected me and then I realised it's not just me, it's a lot of people. They just don't feel comfortable talking about it. And you gave them permission? Somewhat. Yeah, that's amazing. 
So, I mean, obviously a number of people have reached out to you that knew you through your joint connections, but the people that you're, you're now documenting through your images and your words are all over the country, and they themselves have incredible stories. So could you just explain the broad variety of issues that people are dealing with and why you're, doc- and why you're documenting it and then how you hope that this will actually accelerate the sort of the transformation in the perception towards addiction and recovery? Yeah, I think there were a couple of motivations. One was that we had told our own story in a lot of different venues, you know, both through the exhibition of Graham's work, the self-portraits that had also been published in New York Magazine and The Guardian, and then through the memoir. And so one motivation was kind of, you know, sometimes the reaction to that was that Graham was the exception, that recovery was rare, especially from addiction to heroin and crack. And so we we knew that wasn't accurate, that there are a lot of people who get beyond addiction and go on to have fulfilling lives and, you know, reconnect with their families, create new relationships, have successful careers. So we started kind of wanting to tell other people's stories and then also just kind of think about the imbalance in media and entertainment coverage of this topic, right? So we we all kind of gravitate toward the, the mayhem of addiction. And by comparison, you know, maybe the recovery story doesn't feel as dramatic. I think people are actually desperate to hear more about recovery trajectories because so many families kind of face this and communities face this and don't really see those narratives in films. So we started by, you know, or Graham really started by going back and kind of trying to reconnect with people that he used to use drugs with. And we started interviewing and photographing that group of people And then it kind of just snowballed from there, you know, other people we met through various connections and kind of adding to this collection of work that really illustrates that, you know, nobody goes through the same process. I think there's some commonalities in terms of, you know, what can be important or helpful for recovery and what can be a barrier, but really wanting to kind of show the diversity of pathways, but also that people do get better. Yeah, I mean, it was an interesting process, you know, because it was a it was a jumping off point for us from continually telling the addiction story. And like Susan says, people gravitate towards that. People think they know everything about it. They they love it in movies, you know. It's got this sort of romanticism or this swagger to it, or whatever you want to call it. It's like the train spotting sort of thing, or whatever, or traffic. There's always that sort of thing about it that people want to read about, and I get that, you know, because it's compelling and it's heartbreaking and it's challenging and it just and it reveals the rawness of the human condition but the other side of that is that there's recovery you know and people do recover and even train spotting for me is a film about recovery at the end it's like choose life you know that's a recovery statement you know traffic amazing movie it's a film about a million little pieces they're all about recovery but they never really touch beyond that little bit it's at the end and there's even in movies when you see them there's that whole thing like and now we're not having mayhem and addiction then. Oh, I'm in a 12-step meeting. I'm all right. There's never, how did you get there and what's your life like now and how do you build those bridges and make those things happen? And I get that that's not as compelling a story, but I think it could be. It's not easy. I've had my ups and downs. I know many people, recovery doesn't come in a one-size-fits-all. And for some people it comes easy, for some people it comes hard, and people relapse, people don't relapse, people rebuild their lives, people struggle, you know, so recovery is, in in some ways it's a much richer and more diverse story than addiction in some ways, because it comes in different forms for different people. And obviously the thing that everyone's aware of is that this country has declared a war on drugs many decades ago, and the drugs are readily available on any street corner across any city in this town in this country. And leaving aside the addiction issues to prescribed drugs, it is fairly all pervasive. Um, It probably has touched every family, yet the stigma that exists for people that have been in addiction and are in recovery exists and, and, and is persistent. Why is that, given that it is just something that's so common, whether it be employers, whether it be the authorities? And it's not something that's uh, as accepted the way that even mental health conditions are now, the stigma is dropping there. 
I think, I mean, you brought up an important, you know, point with the war on drugs, which actually, you know, that was declared in 1971 um, during the Nixon administration. So we're coming up on 50-year anniversary of that in 2021. And that really kind of made not just addiction but drug use a crime. And that's how it's been covered by the media for decades. And so I think a lot of what perpetuates that stigma is that for people, particularly of a certain age, who kind of grew up with that messaging and those images, there have been studies kind of looking at, you know, what do people see on the evening news um, when there's stories about drug busts, you know, and it's helicopters in Central America. It's people of color usually getting arrested regardless of who the story is about. Just these really stigmatizing imagery and you even look at different eras, you know, when meth was the thing everybody was worried about. They were campaigns where the media would publish mugshots and, you know, faces of meth was kind of a campaign, you know, thinking that would dissuade people. So I would say that the media and really even, you know, to some degree, the entertainment industry has really com- been complicit in fostering that stigma by really tying, you know, people who use drugs or people who become dependent on drugs and addicted to drugs as sort of, you know, a moral question, you know, that they made bad choices, that they are responsible for solving their own situation, you know. So there's also this kind of current of individualism, both in how we view the problem and how we view solutions to it. And I think what's been going on this year is really kind of uncovering that there's much more kind of systemic reasons both that addiction happens and kind of systemic responsibility for helping people overcome it that is, I think, going to be key to really making recovery part of this conversation and, you know, how we address it and help people achieve it. Mm-hmm. And also our careers were in a sort of parallel path, Graham, you use a sort of a, a photographer mean in advertising. And I think it's fair to say that um, the advertising industry has its fair share of drug issues, yet because of the perception that it's deemed as recreational, yet a lot of people I have encountered in many years of advertising, I would say, were probably addicted. But it was accepted as seen to be a recreational sort of pastime. I think that's an issue in, in itself. People of privilege are able to indulge in it, where people that may not have that same financial access to choose when they indulge um, are right. often stigmatized more and, and are persecuted the, for it. I think the criminalization of crack cocaine over cocaine when the crack epidemic was around, you know, I mean, the sentencing for crack cocaine is so astronomically high compared to cocaine. And it's basically the same thing, but crack cocaine affected the black community and powder white cocaine was a white drug. And so they criminalised these communities by having these huge sentences, like 25 years. I didn't realise. What's what's the difference between the two? Cocaine, when cooked with baking soda and other things together, gives you a rock of called crack. Mm -hmm. And when you smoke it, it's just a much more intense hit. It's like the mother load mm-hmm. and so you know and it was cheap and it was available cocaine's always been expensive it's always been like some like oh, you have to really you know studio 54 post mm. people at nightclubs snorting it in the bathroom crack cocaine came in five dollar vials and ten dollar vials that people could get quite easy it's much more addictive and at the end of the day much more expensive because you keep having to hit it all the time because the come down is much more severe because it's way stronger and so at the end of the day you're actually spending more sometimes and it's highly, highly, it's really addictive and the come down is really rough. So this is where there's a, a clearly a crossover into racial injustice and the, criminal, the need for criminal justice reform where they intersect. Could you maybe reflect on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, statistics and surveys show that, you know, people use drugs and become addicted to drugs at pretty much similar rates. There might be preferences for certain types of drugs and different demographics or um, populations or communities, really, um, even geographically. But disproportionately, you know, people who get arrested, people who get sentenced, um, disproportionately affects people of color. So, you know, when you think about, okay, how do you overcome if you are addicted? I mean, plenty of people get arrested just for drug use or being involved in the drug trade. But when you come out of that system, you know, what are the barriers to getting better? So if you compare someone who maybe had a, you know, career in law or advertising and became addicted or to drugs or alcohol versus someone who ended up in the criminal justice system, once you have that record, the the barriers to putting your life back together are much higher and, you know, much harder if 
you a have that record in particular if you have that record and aren't white and middle class and i do think class is a really important aspect to look at too because i think if you're poor then the penalties that may end up being a barrier to you being able to get your driving license back you know court fees and fines at that point regardless of your race or ethnicity you know if you owe five ten thousand twenty thousand dollars and that's an impediment to you getting a job, to you being able to, you know, be a parent to your children. That makes it recovery from addiction and kind of reentry after criminal justice involvement just a thousand times harder. So talk about some of the people that you've been documenting and their stories and who's supporting you in this, this process and this project. Well, as Susan said earlier, it started with me reaching out to the people that I use drugs with, you know, partly curious and partly just trying to reconnect with people. And to my surprise, I found that a lot of them had actually gotten clean. They'd been through, a lot of them through the criminal justice system, Mm -hmm. had been arrested, gone through the system, or had been mandated to some sort of rehabilitation, long-term rehabilitation program. But I did find that a lot of the people that I'd used with were actually doing all right. Some of them, not so much so but making attempts. But the ones that weren't doing well, as Susan had said, were the ones that suffered because of their criminal records or their backgrounds or any of these things that came with, that come with a war on drugs. Because you can get criminalised when you go to prison or jail for that, but that record stays with you. It, it, once you've served your time, it's still there. You know, people can find your criminal record, they can find what you've done, and they will stigmatise and label you with that for the rest of your life, potentially. And for women that are trying to get their kids back and get jobs or reconnect with family members or even being seen as people in the community that are upstanding or or even just normal. People will always say, that's a guy that had the habit or that's a guy that was in prison or that's a woman that did this. It's really difficult, you know? So, and that's what the war on drugs has done. So is decriminalizing the solution? I think there's not one thing that's the solution. Um, I think that it'll be interesting to see, you know, particularly in Oregon with passing, you know, that and, you know, following the model of Portugal, that that's one step. What Portugal done? Well, this idea of decriminalization, right? So that we're not going to, you know, automatically send you to jail or prison because, you know, you've been caught carrying drugs. But even with efforts like decriminalization, you still have to wrestle with addiction. And what are we going to do to help people who become addicted as opposed to someone who's just been arrested because they had a small quantity of marijuana or other drugs? And I think, you know, paying attention really to, you know, what even the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed is really, you know, comes down to kind of issues of poverty and social services and access to education and access to opportunities that, you know, those things are all equally important in terms of kind of how do you deal with helping people who have become addicted to, whether it's drugs or alcohol, find a path back to a life where they do not need that substance so is anyone doing it right, getting people the providing the support systems when they are in that process of recovery? I mean, I think Switzerland have also made some big strides in this area, haven't they? Yeah, but you, the thing is, when you look at Switzerland, it's such a small, homogenous group with a good health service system. And then you look at America, they're totally incomparable, incompa- really, because we have a for-profit and a very bad health system for people that really need it. And you have to pay huge amounts of money to get into rehab and stuff. And those places, they provide it. They have a social... Safety net. Safety yeah. net that you just don't have here in any way, shape, or form. So, I mean, it's interesting to make comparisons, but it's a kind of... It's not a great comparison because uh, for obvious reasons. But I think decriminalising is, is a good step. But there is people get mixed up between decrim, especially in the, you know, when you read about it in the paper, they think it means legalising all drugs and they're just going to have crack and heroin on the street corners and people can just get crystal meth anywhere. And it, that's not what it is. Decriminalisation is about not making criminals out of people with drug habits so that they can enter society and move on with their life without that hanging over them. And I think that's a worthwhile move and it's something that we should definitely in America be thinking about because 50 years of the drug war on drugs has not succeeded. Look at how many people are still out there using. People are going to use drugs. So what organisations are you working with to to raise awareness around this issue? 
Well, so one thing has been focusing on exhibitions, so kind of venues. So for the Beyond Addiction Reframing Recovery exhibition, you know, we first had support from the New School, where we both teach in New York City, and then recently from Rochester Institute of Technology up in Rochester, New York. So looking to not just our own projects, but then bring in projects from other people. And much of it has been kind of on a volunteer basis. So just one of the projects that's included in that was started or done by a social worker in Scotland who asked clients to document and take a picture of something that was meaningful in their recovery. So one of the images is a set of keys. And then the person wrote about why keys represented trust and being able to not just have a home and you know, their own key, but also keys to family members' homes, keys to a workplace, keys to a meeting. And I think kind of trying to highlight these projects and people's different perspectives on it is a way to kind of show that, I guess, just expand the narrative beyond our story or the stories of people that we know, but then include kind of even work from international artists and people working in this space. You mentioned COVID. I mean, this year must have driven people deeper into addiction to escape just some of the the traumas that that's brought both people individually and collectively. Have you got any perspectives on that and how we're going to sort of um, navigate the next 12 to 18 months until there's herd immunity? Um, I don't know. It has been hard because I do volunteer work at a syringe exchange and harm reduction is something I believe in. That's a, a, a good way of engaging people and getting them on the right path to sort of keeping healthy and potentially getting into some sort of recovery sort of phase of their life. And that's been hard for me because I taught art and writing workshops there and I was friend, and it's in the neighbourhood where I used to use drugs and a lot of the people that are there are people that I knew from back then so just from the feedback I've got from people from there it's it's been tough on them because it's, it's that sense of community is lost for people they can't go to the places and hang out with the people and see the people because everywhere's closed and there's no in-person anything so I think a lot of people are falling through the gaps and it might take a wee while yet before it really hits home as to how many people have maybe relapsed or gone back into sort of negative behaviours with drug use and stuff like that. Because of data on alcohol use, if you just look at sales themselves, they're, they're through the roof. The alcohol and the beverage companies are laughing all the way to the bank. But if that's the case, then you surely expect that people that are, have been dealing with addiction are in the process of recovery must have been pushed to the edge during this time. I mean, I think it'll be a while before we really see that. I mean, even with the alcohol sales, like how much of it has shifted from where you would do drinking in a bar or restaurant to a different type of sale. But I think there's no question that people are kind of turning to substances just you know, primarily to cope with isolation, um, economic insecurity, illness and death of friends and family members. And what data has emerged is definitely suggests that there will be a significant increase in overdose deaths um, in the U.S. I mean, Scotland's figures came out recently and are much higher and trending upward. So I think the isolation is definitely a concern and then just the precariousness. On the flip side of that, I think there may be some silver linings in the sense that there's more empathy now. I mean, if you think about recovery really broadly, I think we're all going to be recovering from this very extraordinary year, you know, certainly in the United States, not just with the pandemic. And, you know, it's an opportunity to really think about, well, what does that process involve? And, you know, how do we support people? And how can online technology be helpful? So that's one positive benefit of the pandemic is that for a variety of support groups for people, mutual aid groups, shifting online to being able to have those telehealth appointments, support meetings, counseling sessions, that's something that if you had told people we'd all be doing that a year ago, it would have been unimaginable. And for programs that provide methadone to people, they've relaxed some of the kind of strict rules about, you know, having to come and get methadone every day from a particular location. So there's going to be a lot of research looking at, well, did it turn out that that was okay and that we don't need to, you know, have people come every single day and do the kind of monitoring, um, So I think hopefully there will be some lessons learned that kind of increase services and uh, opportunities for people to get help. 
You recently uh, gained your master's in public health from a um, policy perspective rather than, I mean, you've, you've got, obviously you're doing great storytelling, but you must have a strong point of view if you were put in a position, uh, let's say, of the mayor's office or where you could actually call the shots. What, what radical things would you do to change? I think some of it that I've been exposed to comes down to like how funding is distributed. So, you know, on one project I worked on, it was interesting to hear people that get grants, whether it's a local health department or a nonprofit organization, that often grants are very restricted, both in how long they last and what they can be used for. So there was this period where a lot of money was going toward opioids and the opioid epidemic. And drug patterns shift constantly, right? So already people were noticing trends that more people were using meth or there was an increase in overdoses that involved benzodiazepines. So thinking about grant making and making it more nimble so that it's not just tied to one specific drug or a short time period, I think, is going to be one way to kind of allow organizations that are closer to delivering services to make decisions about how that money is used. So anyone who's followed Mackenzie Scott's um, recent donations, um, mm, that's I a lot think of money. it was, she just, I can't remember, it was close to 400 organizations. Mm, but yeah. one thing she really prioritized was letting the organizations decide how the money is being used. So unrestricted grant making. Um, and then a second thing really noticing is how much services are really siloed. So figuring out ways to have people working on disp- different aspects of these problems work together. So you have people working on mental health and counseling who might be very separate from people who are working on harm reduction services like distributing, you know, the overdose reversal drug Narcan, who might be very separate from residential treatment programs, who might be very separate from policymakers. So figuring out ways to bridge these silos that can kind of happen and really get people on working toward a similar strategy, even if they're not that piece of it. So one thing we really try to emphasize is kind of this three prong, like, you know, the importance of reducing harm associated with drug use and addiction, improving treatment, and then supporting recovery. So having these kind of simple bullet points that everybody can kind of agree on, even if they're just working on one piece of it, I think can help. And maybe a fourth one there is really recognizing that there are communities that really do have concerns about public safety as part of this, and kind of how do you reconcile that with... What do you mean, public safety? Well, just that the drug trade brings its own harms to communities and policing and over-policing. So with rates of gun ownership in the United States, I think things here look very different than they do in some of these other countries that people hold up as models. So as much as many people agree that the police aren't the best to be dealing with drug problems and addiction and certainly getting people into treatment, the fact is that's it's going to take kind of figuring out how what's the alternative to that when people still are going to call 911 when they have a dealer on their corner um, or in their building that's bothering them. If we're if being brutal about the just the harsh reality of addiction, as long as there's economic disparity, as long as we are facing um, the crisis, let's say if the way that capitalism is at the moment, and the the, the economic injustices that exist. Beneath the figures that people say are and so many people employed before COVID and all that, the reality is people are struggling. The disparity between the super wealthy and the the disappearing middle class has been well documented. Until that issue's resolved, until there's some sort of reimagining of world beyond capitalism or whether it's through triple bottom line that's talked about at Davos, and there's still going to be a market for drugs. Now, totally bind what you're saying about re- the reframing recovery and, and decriminalizing. But surely there's all these dealers out there and you know, we've, well, we've all watched shows like Narcos and realized how much money is to be made from it. Until something is done about the economic side of it, there's going to be endless supplies available for people. And as long as people are struggling and suffering, they're going to fall into that trap of addiction. Just go back to that war on drugs. I, I think I don't know a great deal about it. But surely there's something has to be done around that area of, you mentioned, Graham, about the difference between decriminalisation and legalisation. Surely if it was something that was put into government control and you could actually prescribe and take it away from the black market, wouldn't that be a, a better solution long term? 
an interesting comparison that doesn't get made enough really is looking at alcohol, right, which is legal in most places. And, you know, by comparison causes more harms financially and just socially in terms of people who become dependent on alcohol. And yet we kind of accept that as something that I don't think anybody or any real constituency is arguing for prohibition again, right? So if you take the broad spectrum of people who use both drugs and alcohol and don't develop a problem and don't end up in the kind of situation Graham was in, in both cases, it's how do you set up systems to support the people who do become dependent, right? So I think that... One thing that doesn't also get talked about enough is that for the long time in the United States, health insurance did not have to cover either mental health treatment or addiction treatment. So it's actually fairly wow. new in the U.S. that your insurance would cover treatment. And I think a lot of the solutions are going to be focused on enforcing those parity laws. And there's some work being done on that and really offering better treatment opportunities and more treatment for people mm -hmm. who develop problems. So if that answers your question on one end, and then I think the kind of drug trade and narcos comparison raises this other issue of, does that go away even with decriminalization? I mean, that's a powerful force and constituency that even as marijuana has been decriminalized and legalized in many states and countries, um, there's still a market that exists outside the legal market. So I think one has to be sort of accepting of the reality that there are going to be a lot of powerful people looking to protect that market. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Graham, I don't think are you... Um, yeah, I mean, I just don't know what legalization looks like. I mean, I've read about it and I've heard people talk about it, you know, but I don't, I don't really... Given what Susan said, it's like you're up against these huge drug dealer narco cartels who are protecting multi, 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 multi million dollar empires, they're not just going to turn around and go, oh, it's all legal, let's pack it in and give it over to the pharmaceuticals who were responsible for the opioid crisis. <laughs> yeah. So once you put it in the hands of the government or the clinician, whoever it is, that doesn't mean it's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. I mean, opioids were legal. They were prescribed legally to anybody who wanted them, and look what happened. So, I mean, it's not enough just to throw around these terminologies like legalize, because... It has to be well thought out. And, you know, the knee-jerk reaction for most people in the street about legal drugs is pretty like, well, what does that mean? Well, I don't even know what it means really in, in real terms. Does that mean I go and buy a Diet Coke and a bag of crisps and three grams of Coke? I know that's just being funny, yeah. but, you know, I don't know what that really looks like in terms of who handles it, who profits from it. Because we live in a capitalist society. Is it open to people, entrepreneurs and hedge funders and venture capitalists to open, like, these legal cocaine businesses and whatever? You know, I, I don't know what it looks like. I'd like to hear what it looks like. I'd like to see a, a, a really well thought out plan. Of how would that work in the society we live in? But as yet, I've never really seen that apart from these token voices that say legalize it because it'll be a safer drug supply, which is true because it won't be cut with fentanyl and it would reduce deaths. But who pays for all that? Who pays for do, do we just go, do we get a card? Or I, I really don't know how it looks. I mean, it, it's an interesting concept. So, I mean, you've been. 10 years in your, your journey. How have you dealt with it on a personal basis and what's kept you going through those ups and downs that you talked about? How have I dealt with it? I dealt with it remorsefully and badly in the beginning. It will be 11 years in May. So in the first nine of that, I was incarcerated. Nine, year, nine months, sorry. And so I was in Rikers Island. I got taken off the streets for too many drug arrests and sent to Rikers Island and subsequently immigration detention after that. And it was very rough, you know, I mean, because with that clarity of not using and clouding and the cloudy vision that comes with addiction and just masking the pain continually by using, everyone gets to sink in really deep. And for me, it was like, even the times I tried to quit when I was on the streets, it, it wasn't really so much the craving for the drugs and the need for it physically, which is there. It was that big, dark cloud that descended on me of where I'd been, what I'd done, who I'd disappointed, who I'd lied to, the mess my life was in that drove me back mm -hmm. a lot of the time because I couldn't deal with it. It was mental trauma. 
And that's where the mental health issue comes in with addiction. Your mind has been altered by drugs and your perception and how rational you think or don't think. And you don't produce the dopamine and the, the feel goods that normal people do. And so you're very susceptible to depression and anxiety and stuff like that. So early on was rough. But since I got up, I think that having a supporting relationship has been really good for me. It's not been easy for both of us at certain times. And we don't live in a bed of roses. We're like other couples, you know. But having a supporting relationship is important. It, it was very important for me. But not only somebody who's supportive, but somebody who doesn't let you wallow in self-pity and stuff like that, who motivates you and makes you feel like you are you can be something. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was really important to me. And I, I had privilege. I was educated. I had a career before. I had friends that still were willing to accept me back and I got a job pretty quick. It was hard rebuilding a, a 10 years of chaos left behind me. But there were people who still opened doors for me and I realised that that is not the same for a lot of people. You've mentioned you've sort of been rebuilding your career. You teach at Parsons and you've been rebuilding your photography career. What are your expectations going forward for the next 10 years? Both individually as a photographer but also as a storyteller working with Susan on reframing recovery. It's some I'm pretty passionate about and Susan's pretty passionate about is like working with people who've been disenfranchised because of their addiction or their criminal backgrounds and stuff like that because it, it's not only cathartic to them and me and Susan when you speak to people it's just the feeling of self-worth for people when they, when, you, when they see that someone takes interest in them and shares their story and wants to hear their story is really it's a kind of beautiful thing and I think we're doing our bit, but I just, I think as I as I get older and I'd, I'd like to gravitate to more towards peer support and help and storytelling and just trying to pull away some of that shame and stigma and making people feel better about mm. One of the things we've kind of gravitated toward recently is this concept of collaborative storytelling. So having worked in media for most of my career and now for the last four years I've been teaching ethics and the history of journalism. So really thinking about sort of what can be a very extractive nature of journalism, you know, that someone else is coming in to tell your story. And that's sort of been thought of as more objective than someone telling their own story or personal narrative. But because of sort of the history of who's had access to those storytelling opportunities, you know, that there's m rightly much more questioning now, whether it's within media organization, who gets publishing deals. Um, I think there's an opportunity to really think about, you know, why we have this approach that um, kind of divides between those first person narratives and then the professional journalist coming in and telling your story, um, whether that's through a, doc a filmmaker, um, a reporter for a newspaper, um, a CNN segment. And so what we've kind of tried to do is is figure out a kind of an artistic practice and a storytelling pra practice that is more collaborative where you're not just saying, I'm going to record hours of interviews with you and I'm choosing what to reveal and how it'll be presented. And so really work with people. And I think one of the motivations for that is the the consequences of being public about particularly addiction and a criminal record and really figuring out a way that you can do that type of storytelling in a way that inspires other people and provides hope to families that are still struggling in communities but still protects the person who's sharing their story. Hmm. What about on a personal level, how has your journey changed you? I mean, you probably never anticipated in 2000, was it 2002 when you first met? that you'd be 18, 19 years on um, sitting here having this discussion. But it must have had a transformative effect on both of you. Yeah, I think every relationship goes through things. You know, you could have a struggle with a medical diagnosis or an accident or something. And for us, you know, the addiction and incarceration um, definitely had a lasting, lasting impact just in terms of, I think for me, being aware of what, how fortunate we are that we had the resources and the ability to, to come through that. Um, not just, you know, material resources, but I think the support from people in our lives and just kind of internally and just an awareness of 
things that I never expected that I'd be thinking about immigration. Somebody once asked me would I change it all, and that was an interesting question. You know, if you、mm-hmm. could go back, would you change it so that you and. It's hard because you know that experience has brought so much to me in terms of the way I, I am now and the people I've met through this and the sort of relationships I have and the sort of clarity of the world. It's not that I wasn't aware of a lot of things, but I'm sort of way more aware. So, I mean, I wouldn't recommend my pathway、mm-hmm. to as a way of enlightenment or you know understanding of the world by any stretch, but at the same time. It, It can hear us where it is. I'm not glad it happened to me, but I've accepted it. I think it's about acceptance. Thinking like I can't dwell on this and go, "This was terrible. That was terrible." It happened, and I, yeah, I got some regrets. I missed out on some of my son's years, and I upset my mom and dad. But at the end of the day, I think at this stage, it is kind of enlightening and rewarding to be the person I am now, given what I went through and what the relationships with friends and family are now. Has it changed you as a photographer? Interesting question, because I think it's made me the photographer I always was.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I had a specific style of photography that I had for many years, and then when I went into commercial work and advertising and working on a commissioned basis. I kind of became rudderless as a photographer. I didn't take many pictures for myself. I did a lot of commercial work, and it was good stuff, but it wasn't a That heartfelt Graham thing. I'm a documentarian. I love documentary photography, and I think that over the last year, especially with doing the photographs of people in recovery, but also just like the the COVID and the Black Lives Matter, I really rediscovered myself as a photographer, and I feel I now have that passion back to be that sort of photographer I always really wanted to be.、Mm-hmm. And it's kind of late in life to say that maybe, but at the same time, I think it's always been there.、Mm-hmm. I just put it on the sideline for so long and kind of forgot about it, and I've sort of excavated it and thought, wow. That's what I really should have been doing for many years. So I've sort of approached it with a new vigor and passion. What about your writing, Susan? Are you a d- transformed writer because of this? Well, I think writing a memoir after doing articles largely for a newspaper for many, many years that was definitely transformative, and also a collaboration. I mean, working together to write that book and try to make the chapters alternate and sound. Like me versus a narrative voice that was more like Graham. That was different. And now thinking less about a written output than the interview process and kind of how can you get quotes from people to pair with ph- photographs that capture the nuance and complexity of people's stories but aren't too overwhelming to read.、Hmm. If people do want to reach out to you, get you to come along, share your exhibition or talk or be part of a group, where do they find you? Just Google me. I'm very easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> I think for the recovery exhibition, reframingrecovery.org is our website, and there's a contact form on that. And then my website is susanstellin.com. So S U S A N S T E L L I N, and then Grams is grammackender.com. Yeah, well, I'll put it in the show notes. We always finish with quick fire questions, so either one of you can answer them. You don't, you don't both have to. So, principles. What principles do you stand by? Understanding, empathy, non-judgmental, love. That was quick.、Um, I would say, <laughs> I would say, loyalty, justice, and、oh, I'm going to put love in them. <laughs> you can go. You can be、um, loveless. <laughs> Is hope a principle? You know, I think in tr- trying to do work that's inspiring to other people.、Mm-hmm. Okay, they're good.、Um, hard choices. What hard choices have you made that might have been tough at the time, but turned out to be the right decision? Well, for me, that's <laughs> I think you maybe answered that. <laughs> yeah, I think deciding to、um, reach out and help Graham when he was in immigration detention. The choice to go public. With his and our story, that was a hard choice. Yeah, I would have to say that's my hardest choice because it's easy to just to say, "Well, that happened. I don't want to talk about it and sweep it under the rug and just hope that it all goes away and you know disappears." But once you go public with it, especially with photographs and because of the internet, and、uh, it's public forever,、mm-hmm. and it's out there. So that was a tough choice, and we had to take a lot of consider- things into consideration before we did that. But it was worth it.、Mm. Um, where do you go to discover new ideas?、Uh, 
I got in my bike or I go and run. It's something we didn't really touch on, I'm just going to throw it in there, but running is really, you know, we met through running all those years ago, and running is still an important part of my life, not in a speedy competitive way, but just in terms of a more meditative, transcendental sort of quiet space for me. Even if I'm going slow, it's, and a lot of my ideas come then. I get time to think. I don't listen to music. I don't do any of that. I just go and I try and, I try and detach for, and just think about my breathing and then what's going on. I would say travel, you know, and I really miss that right now. Yeah, um, good I think, luck. <laughs> yeah, getting that perspective from being in a different place and just kind of getting removed from the daily routine of your life has always been really inspiring for me. So that's something I'm, I'm missing right now. Okay. Aside from the project you're working on, obviously the importance um, of um, reframing recovery, what is one other problem that's worth solving? Inequality. I think almost every problem you can identify stems back to economic inequality right uh-huh. now. Well, economic, I mean, racial inequality, just inequality on many levels. Yeah, I would have to second that, you know. And the environment, yeah. I think, is a really massive one that's been sort of pushed to the side a wee bit because was that the environment we don't have anything? So we were fighting for things that might not even be in this world in 150 years. Who's made you reevaluate yourself? I guess Susan's made me reevaluate myself. That's an obvious choice. But I have a friend of mine called Kim, and she was someone I spent many years in addiction with. She's in recovery. She does peer support stuff and takes meetings into jails. When I struggle sometimes, I call her or just when I, or I text her. It's not that she makes me reevaluate myself. She just grounds me and makes me realise where I'm at, what I've been through, and how I should conduct myself. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think she'd be... It's not really reevaluate, but close to yeah. Well, I would say Graham definitely is one, and then for me, it's my friend Lisa, who I think plays a similar role for me, just in terms of being able to step back and have that perspective. Okay. Um, impossible question. What's your advice to someone that's either about to study, graduate, that's got a dream, a big goal, ambition, but has been told, forget it. It's just beyond the realms of possibility. Oh, I have an op-ed that was originally published in the Wall Street Journal, and now I don't remember who wrote it, but um, it was a, it's about all the people who, you know, were famously rejected before they succeeded. So I think, um, I think we don't talk enough about rejection, and there's another, an academic who published a, a rejection resume and kind of... Yeah, dropped. I've heard about that. I, yeah. I, li- I like it. I've often um, thought that it would be a really good thing for businesses to do to, is to ask people for their rejection resume mm-hmm. right, as a key part of any application. I think that, you know, follow your dream, be passionate, embrace it, but also be realistic. I'm putting together a playlist for Spotify for guests' uh, go-to karaoke songs. Which two would you pick? You Gotta Be by Desiree. So I'm going to have to pick a Clash song because they're like one of my first and favourite bands. And it would have to be Safe European Home by The Clash. You surprised me. OK. It's going in the list. Besides your book, what book would you like us to offer listeners that come up with the best comments in Instagram or on the website? Michelle Obama's memoir. OK. Uh, I think I'd have to choose The Lost Tornado by Jim Devine because, uh, you know, it reflects a lot of how I grew up as well, that working class Scottish sort of upbringing. So, and it's quite funny as well. So I, I think I'd keep it lighthearted and go with Jim Devine. OK. Um, final question. Who should we interview next? I'm not sure who will do it, but uh, I would recommend Ben Hartley, the director of the National Arts Club. Australian guy, lives in New York, runner. And round the corner. Right. Okay. Well, you make a little introduction to see if we can get him. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. He's a good guy. He's very good. Okay. Well, thank you very much and appreciate the amazing work you're doing. I'm going to continue to follow it, not just the uh, recovery and addiction work, but also your writing and your photography. And um, wish you all the best with the next five to ten years and the transformational effect you have on people's lives. Huge. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Okay. That's all for this week, folks. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe, rate, recommend, or review, depending on where you listen. And if you have someone you'd like us to interview, just DM us on Instagram at The Impossible Network or email us at info at theimpossiblenetwork.com. And please give our other podcast, The Raw Hospitality Show, a listen. They are both Fabrica Collective Productions. See you next time.